Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is John. I'm a PhD candidate in psychology and philosophy at Stanford University. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about meta change making and its relationship to life improvement science. And I'll be joined shortly by some collaborators who can introduce themselves in a bit. Um, but before we get into it, I just wanted to walk you through this hypothetical scenario to try to think about the importance of the topic that we're exploring. So imagine this. You're someone who wants to make a positive impact on the world. And you can suppose that there's two approaches to making a positive impact, right? One of which is to be a change maker, to focus on a handful of issues, say, for example, climate change, AI risks, uh, biosecurity, what have you. Um, and this is a, a necessary and a highly laudable approach to trying to make a positive impact on the world. But we also want to consider a second approach in this presentation. And that approach is trying to make change makers, so trying to, to foster within other people the motivation and the confidence to try to make a positive impact on the world so that they themselves can be change makers. So we have these two approaches uh, for, for the sake of this uh, exploration. Um, we, we want to ask the question, how much impact could these two approaches have? Well, to explore this question, we could employ some toy assumptions and I've capitalized this and put some exclamation marks because I really want to emphasize that these are toy assumptions. They're not necessarily the most accurate reflections of you know, what would happen if you were to think about the scenario in, in, in detail, uh, but nevertheless, they might suffice to illustrate a point which we're about to make about the respective impact of these two approaches. So uh, for the purposes of this exercise, without getting too stuck into the details, um, please indulge these uh, toy assumptions. So one of them is that it takes five change makers five years to solve one problem. So uh, suppose, for instance, that you have five people who are working to solve some sort of environmental pollution problem uh, in the county of San Jose, California, in the United States. So that's one assumption. It takes five change makers five years to solve one problem. And then we can also make a, a couple more assumptions. Uh, one of which is that five people can create a program that effectively makes 20 change makers after its first five years. And so for instance, you run a program and then five years after you've run the program, you have 20 people who are change makers and are ready to make an impact. So that's, that's the second assumption. A third assumption is that this program can also expand its capacity by a factor of 10 every five years. So after the first five years, it makes 20 people. After the next five years, it makes 200. And then after the next five years, it makes 2,000, right? So these are some toy assumptions. Again, if we're getting stuck into the specific numbers and we've kind of missed the point of it, the point of this is just to illustrate a general point which we might nevertheless find plausible uh, respective of precisely how realistic the assumptions are or what their realistic replacements might be. In any case, let's imagine that we have these assumptions. Uh, okay, how many problems will be solved after a 25 year period if we grant these assumptions? Well, to explore this, we can actually use the help of a graph. So as you can see initially, the be change makers approach uh, isn't too different to the make change makers approach. After a five year period, the be change maker approach has solved one problem, the make change makers one has solved none. Uh, 10 year period, be change makers have solved two and make change makers have solved none. But in the long term, you start, start to see a drastic difference. So according to these toy assumptions then, after a 25 year period, the make change makers approach has solved 544 problems, whereas the be change makers approach has solved five. Uh, after a 30 year period, the make change makers approach has solved 6,176 problems, uh, whereas the be change makers approach has solved six. And uh, you can basically imagine that the impact of this program could uh, you know, um, drastically uh, increase over time as the capacity of the program increases. So these are some toy assumptions about the impact of two approaches, right? Being a change maker on the one hand and making change makers on the other. So the second approach of making change makers is what we call meta change making. It's not about just being a change maker, it's about in addition to that, trying to cultivate change makers. This presentation then is about meta change making. So here are some of the topics that we're going to explore, one of which is what the concept of meta change making is in relation to life improvement science. We're then going to talk about the project that I'm working on with um, some other lovely people, uh, which is called the Meta Change Makers Project. We're going to talk about the relevance of these things to life improvement science. We're going to examine some lit uh, lessons that have emerged from our research into literature so far. And then we're going to conclude with some next steps, how you and everyone involved here uh, can help our project if you want to get involved. All right, so conceptual issues. So life improvement science is the science of helping people do more good in better ways, developing themselves and living, living a meaningful life. Meta change making, as we use the term, refers to the cultivation of change makers. That is people with the capacity and motivation 
to make a positive impact on the world, to contribute to collective well-being, and to address its challenges. So how do these two concepts relate together? Um, so essentially, we see uh, life improvement science as being this um, very worthwhile, humongous research program, and meta change making as uh, being sort of like a research program within that research program that tries to uh, tackle a specific question about how to cultivate change makers. And we can think of it like this. Um, so meta change making involves cultivating change makers or well doers who improve the lives of others and arguably improve their own lives in the process. So that's the first pass at trying to characterize the relationship between these two concepts. There's specific examples of meta change making that we could look at. So one, for instance, is the Highlander Folk School, uh, which supported the um, United States Civil Rights Movement in the 20th century. Another one is uh, Fondayek, the Foundation for the Application and Teaching of the Sciences, which has uh, rolled out um, meta change making um, educational experiences throughout Latin America. Um, so that then is a little bit about the conceptual issues to do with change making life improvement science. Now to talk about uh, the Meta Change Makers Project. So the Meta Change Makers Project is an interdisciplinary team of researchers who aim to better understand how to cultivate change makers. And what we're doing in the meantime is, well, at the moment, I should say, is trying to pursue two lines of research. One of which is literature research, which is where we get into uh, basically doing a review of the academic literature and seeing what that has to say about how to cultivate change makers. The other one is what we call program research, which actually involves looking at grassroots meta change making programs that may or may not have any academic literature published about them. So we see these as two sources of insight into meta change making, one of which the academic literature on the other hand, and the other one being the experience of grassroots meta change making programs on the other. Um, so there's actually a bit more to, to our project than just that. This is a, a graph that you will find on our website, which I can actually link you to now if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about the Meta Change Makers project. Um, and that describes our, our sort of uh, rationale um, and, and uh, I guess plans in more detail. Uh, moving on then, uh, a little bit more about this literature research. So what we're doing is trying to build an annotated bibliography, which I'm going to link you through into the, uh, in the chat now. Um, so everyone can have a look at this. It's just a draft version, so please don't distribute that with others. We're hoping to update it and then produce a final version fairly soon. Um, but what we're doing with this annotated bibliography is trying to look at a whole bunch of different uh, works that look at one topic to do with meta change making or, or, or another. Um, and we're trying to provide annotations about them that give a description of what they're about and what their relevance is to, to meta change making. Um, then what we've done is we've also cross-checked the annotations to see whether they meet particular desiderata. So for instance, whether they're accurate representations of the works that they're about, whether they try to discuss them in ways that are clear, that reflect neutrality with respect to the um, subject matter and so forth. And this at the moment is just a modest and a first attempt. So there's a lot of literature that's out there. We have no you know, um, sort of uh, delusion that we've uh, found it all. We're still gathering works. And actually um, this conference has been just amazing because there's been so many interesting, valuable contributions from people here, including at this presentation to this literature. Um, and so uh, we're hoping that in one way or another that can be integrated into the bibliography uh, with time. So this is a modest and a first attempt at trying to, to um, summarize the literature and as I said the, the link is in the chat so you can um, uh, go and have a look at that now if you like. Um, but also we would like to make an invitation to people here who have for instance authored studies on um, say some aspect to do with well doing or you know so for instance we've looked at these amazing studies over the past few days about for instance uh, frustrated well doing and the impact that, that can have on people and related topics. Um, so for those people who have um, authored papers or studies that relate to the question of how to um, uh, cultivate change makers um, and it's, for some papers, they might be more or less relevant to it. Some people might be looking directly at interventions. Some people might be looking at insights that don't have to do with interventions to uh, promote change making, but nevertheless relate to it in one way or another. Uh, we would love to collaborate with you if you're interested. So one option for you, if you're interested, is to make an annotation for your own work, um, to contribute that to the, the bibliography. And then if you want, you can also be included as a co-author of the annotated bibliography, um, just by contributing one of your own annotations for, for a work that you've been involved in. Or it could be many of your annotations. It doesn't need to be one. Um, basically, I, we don't really you know, mind who, who's a co-author and who's not. The primary motivation for us is to try to do as much good for humanity as possible. And we feel like the more researchers that are involved in that and contributing their insights to that, the better we'll be able to do that. 
And so if you contribute your annotation, then uh, we'll try to distribute that to grassroots programs and other people who might want to draw on that for the sake of trying to do good for the world. So those are our lofty aspirations, as cheesy as they may sound. But the moral of the story is please contact us and get involved if you're interested. Okay, so in any case, that's a little bit about the literature research we've been engaged in. Uh, what are some of the outcomes of this, namely some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the open questions? We're going to survey this now for the rest of the, the presentation. So some of these lessons have to do with the context of meta change making, and I'm going to be talking about that, so that's why my name is in the brackets there. One of these lessons is that there is dissatisfaction with educational systems around the world, and this has been voiced in the literature. So for instance, Kaplan argues that a lot of educational systems get students to engage in work that doesn't really enrich their lives or improve their productivity. Gill and Thompson have argued that educational systems can actually be detrimental to, to well-doing or change-making in certain ways because they can uh, basically contribute to a culture of uncaring through emphasizing um, uh, financial gain or individualism through the competition for great and so forth. So there is some dis dissatisfaction with educational systems at the moment, but there are also some uh, meta change making programs that already exist and are functioning at different um, scales with different degrees of systematicity and effectiveness. And um, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of these might be disconnected. So the insights that are learned in Ireland, for example, might not necessarily be shared with meta change making programs in Colombia who could potentially apply those insights. So there are also some references there and also in the meta change making annotated bibliography, which you can look at if you're interested. Um, we're now going to move on to a second category of lessons that will be presented by a collaborator on the meta change makers project, um, Brandon Renante. So Brandon, if you're here, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so one lesson is that efficacy as a change maker depends on both internal and external variables. Internal psychological variables include factors such as an individual's motivations, knowledge, values, attitudes, emotions, self-efficacy, skills, and identity. External variables include factors associated with cultural, social, economic, or institutional environments, such as cultural norms or physical infrastructure. One important external variable is support from others, such as teachers, peers, or parents. Um, another lesson is that although cultivating change makers seems to be an ongoing long-term process, there is some evidence uh, suggesting that even brief psychological and educational interventions can facilitate positive shifts toward becoming a change maker. For example, one study found that people are significantly more likely to register and turn out to vote if asked about their identity as a voter, rather than if asked simply about whether they engage in voting behavior. The key insight was that participants appeared more likely to engage in relevant beneficial behavior if doing so was tied to valuable aspects of their identity. Uh, one open question is, what is the relative importance of internal versus external variables? Thanks for that, Brandon. So that's a, a category of lessons to do with uh, general issues about meta change making. Um, and now we want to focus on some uh, lessons to do with, uh, and, um, I guess, uh, cultivating the motivation to be a change maker. The, the central idea here is that it seems like if you want to cultivate change makers, then you need to do um, a, a, at least one thing, which is to try and imbue people with the motivation to engage in well doing or to be a change maker. So, um, what are some lessons in this department? One of which is that altruistic acts can be motivated in quite different ways. So for instance, um, one study of people who rescued uh, some Jewish people during Nazi Germany, um, uh, basically they found that people were motivated for different reasons. Some people were motivated out of feelings of empathy for the Jewish people, others by abstract principles of justice, um, and others by, for instance, social reasons, uh, for example, pressure from a pastor or from a family member to try to rescue the Jewish people in Nazi Germany. Um, another lesson is that interventions in general can affect motivation. So one prominent approach to affecting motivations in social psychology is the so-called social norms approach, where you basically encourage people to engage in some behavior by communicating to them information about what other people who they care about are doing or what those other people um, approve of. Um, and so another lesson is that these interventions can be tailored specifically, at least in some circumstances, uh, to fostering altruism, or at least the, there's potential for those interventions to be tailored as such. So um, one for an, another approach, for instance, is what we're calling the happiness altruism approach. And that has actually been a, a pretty um, 
prominent theme of this conference. And that's basically just the idea that we can encourage people to engage in altruistic behavior by um, informing them uh, through abstract classroom discussions or through practical experience that altruism can result in this sort of reward of happiness if they engage in it. So those are two um, different approaches to fostering altruism, the social norms approach and the happiness altruism approach. And there's also a few others which we've discussed in the Meta Change Makers Annotated Bibliography, which you can see for yourself. Um, and also people here might have other um, uh, interventions which they would like to contribute to the annotated bibliography um, as a co-author or in some other way. Um, so we've got some open questions here too. One of which is that it's not clear which intervention is best for a given context. So the social norms approach might do a very good job of uh, motivating well-doing in cases where the well-doing or the change-making is quite costly to the change-maker or the well-doer. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the well-doing or the change making is endorsed by social norms in the environment. However, the happiness altruism approach might do a good job of motivating altruism in cases where um, the, the relevant behavior isn't uh, a norm in one's environment, but nevertheless could result in some happiness for the potential change maker altruist. So which intervention works best for a given context is an open question that we're exploring. Um, we also have a second category of lessons to do with the competencies, because the idea is that even if you have the motivation to be a change maker, you won't be effective unless you have specific competencies. And Brandon is now going to talk us a little bit, um, talk to us about that now. Take it away, Brandon. Right. Uh, so as John mentioned, even if one has the motivation to make a change, they won't be successful unless they have particular competencies, that is, particularly particular skills or dispositions that can make one an effective change maker. Uh, and there are various frameworks for developing competencies. For example, one study identified a set of competencies for change makers that included things like perseverance, innovation and creativity, critical thinking, communication, and problem solving. Um, additionally, action-oriented solving of social problems in the real world, followed by critical reflection and discourse on those experiences are crucial, um, what we're calling meta competencies. And so these are the abilities to, uh, act and reflect are not only competencies in their own right, but they're higher level competencies that facilitate the development of many others. Uh, and it, along this line of research, uh, one open question is, which competencies are domain general, that is perhaps necessary for all contexts, and which are domain specific, that is necessary only for specific contexts? Thanks, Brandon. Um, now we also have another uh, Meta Change Makers project team maker, Ollie, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about methods of change making. Take it away, Ollie. Thanks, John. Um, so obviously there are a huge number of ways to make change, um, but what I want to do is, is divide them into two uh, main buckets, top down versus bottom up. Um, so top down in this context is um, well-educated and resourced members of society going into communities to create change. Um, so can you, uh, can you click down, um, click, um, down, John, thanks. Um, so one example um, that we found from, from literature is, is white students from Harvard and Yale working on voting rights in 1960s Mississippi. Um, now, these kinds of approaches can bring advantages. So the white students um, were able to, for example, attract the attention of media, uh, major news outlets who at the time had been ignoring a struggle up to that point. They were able to bring additional resources, often they were richer, um, they you know, came from family backgrounds with a lot more money, um, and they may have been able to bring particular skills. However, this also comes with certain disadvantages. Um, it creates cultural tensions between uh, white students who might think they know it all, um, and people who are actually on the ground, who understand the situation. Um, a lack of sustained change, what happens when these students just leave, um, as many of them did fairly quickly when they found it as hard as they thought it would be. Um, they're going to have less understanding of the community and the issues that they face. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, I want to contrast that with um, bottom-up um, approaches to change, uh, developing organic leaders from within a community. I want to go back to, to Mississippi here. Um, in Mississippi, there were a series of literacy programs, which were um, training as part of trying to get um, black sharecroppers to vote, um, was trying to train, train them in literacy. Um, and as part of the literacy programs, um, organizers would try and find people who had the respect of the local community and try and develop them, get them to take on more organizational um, tasks um, and then push forward uh, movements for voting rights, for equal access to um, services in their local area. Now, this has clear advantages. Um, these people are gonna have a clear understanding of their community. They're embedded in their community. 
They're going to be there for the long term. Um, now, but also disadvantages. So they're not going to have the same media attention as the um, uh, as the white students. They're not going to have access to the same kind of resources and the same institutional support. They're going to be more vulnerable to reprisals potentially. Um, so whenever you're thinking about um, change making and indeed meta change making, I think it's important to to compare and contrast these two approaches and ask to what extent you're you're taking one approach versus the other. And I think particularly someone in my position. Um, white, middle class, from an academic background, I have more of a tendency, I think, to think more top down. And so reading some of this literature about what people can accomplish when they're doing more of a bottom up approach um, has been a really kind of interesting and enlightening for me personally. And I think that's something we can, we can all um, reflect on. Um, thanks, John. Cool, thank you. So that's sort of a, a summary then of some lessons that have emerged from the literature. Um, again, this is just our take on it. There's also a bunch of other insights and arguments that have been presented in the works that are surveyed in the annotated bibliography. So we would encourage people to look at that. Um, and, and now Brandon's going to be talking a little bit about some of the next steps for the project. Brandon. Thanks, John. Uh, we have a few immediate lines of next steps. So one is to conduct further literature research. So as John mentioned, the annotated bibliography we put together was really just a first attempt. And so we're really looking to uh, expand upon that. Um, and second, uh, as John also mentioned earlier, we plan to do some program research where we can really do some studying of actual change maker programs to figure out you know, what are uh, their models of meta change making? Um, what are some of the outcomes they've achieved? What are some lessons learned that they can share more broadly? Uh, potentially farther down the line, we want to run some experiments to create and study our own in original interventions aimed at cultivating change makers. And we also have some specific calls to action for all of you. Uh, we really appreciate you staying all the, all the way till the end of this conference. Um, and uh, we have a survey, um, if you have time to fill it out, I think John's gonna link to that in the chat. Um, but essentially we have a few asks. So one is if you have suggestions on critical literature that you think should be included in future bibliographies, uh, in particular, if you are a researcher and you have some uh, you know, studies that you think should be included in here, um, then we would really be open to that and appreciate that. Uh, second, we're really interested in finding out if there are existing change-making programs that we could contact to, to potentially study. Uh, third is suggestions for other people or institutions doing research on meta-change-making. Fourth is uh, any potential collaborators. And then uh, we're also looking for potential sources of funding. And lastly, just any feedback you have, uh, any questions or suggestions we would uh, really be open to. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you um, for that, Brandon, and, and also to, to the audience for this. So uh, what we really encourage everyone to do is just to have a look at that survey now and to even start filling it out now if you can, just to make sure that we get your feedback. Um, aside from that, we just want to uh, thank some other people, the meta, uh, members of the Meta Changemakers team, as well as some people who have given advice to the project uh, in one way or another, formally or informally, and that includes uh, um, Zenit Mohi, Ross Hall, people from the Ashoka Foundation, some people from Stanford University, and uh, Jim Thompson. Um, so thanks a lot to, to all of those people. Um, and lastly, uh, we want to keep in contact with you all. So uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter or to, to email any of us. Uh, I'm pretty new to Twitter. Um, and you can also contact Brandon by email and Ollie's on Twitter too. And I think that's basically it. If you're interested in the references or in the annotated bibliography, otherwise, thanks so much. And uh, I hope that we can um, collaborate and be in contact with, uh, with hopefully many of you. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, if anyone has a question, we still have a few minutes. Uh, you can raise your hands or you can also use the Google Doc. Hi, David. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if um, character education fits into this framework. So a lot of schools um, have programs focused on developing things like grit and also kindness. Um, so I feel like that could work with the motivation to change and the capacity. So is that the type of things that you're researching as well? Thanks, sorry. Just... Okay. 
Am I muted? Okay. <laughs> great. I can talk now. Um, fantastic. Yeah. So great question. So, I mean, I think, um, I'm, I don't know what the other team members say and uh, think about this. They might have something to say, but my initial thoughts are as follows. So basically I feel like in the literature, there's so many different terms to refer to more or less the same thing, you know, like well-doers, change makers, altruists, et cetera. Um, and I think we're not too concerned specifically about the terminology, but we're interested in what we call competencies. And we use that term for a few reasons. One of which is because there's already um, a, a use of the term and say the, um, uh, the literature around leadership, or development, people are already using the, the term competencies. And, and in particular, what we're interested in is not just in trying to develop uh, um, any kind of virtue or character strength. We're interested specifically in things that will help people become more competent at change making. So that's why we use that term. But we think that definitely includes a number of the character strengths, uh, including the ones that were um, presented in, in the earlier presentation. So uh, yes, we definitely think character strengths are relevant and in some cases just overlap with the competencies that we're interested in. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, I'm guessing it does. Okay, so Michael also has a question. Uh, hi, yeah, a wonderful presentation of uh, both uh, before I don't know how to pronounce her name, but also really fantastic. Um, I have one uh, question about the what you proposed at the top, this relationship between being a change maker versus making change makers. And uh, I just filled this in in your quantics thing, but wouldn't you say that modeling um, is perhaps one of the most effective way to make a change maker. So the fact that I'm doing it and other people are seeing, wow, look at all the good that person is doing. So I'm just, I'm curious how, how you arrived at that. Is that based on anything, th this relationship between doing versus being? Right. Interesting. So I, I'm not sure if we make a distinction between doing or being per se. I've heard that distinction before, but I'm not too sure whether we have much to say about it. One thing that you did talk about was modeling, and I'm not sure whether this touches on your point, but it seems like you might be alluding to the idea that one uh, salient way of making change makers is by trying to model that. And um, so that's, that's one of the uh, approaches that we discuss and um, share some literature about in the annotated bibliography, um, this idea of, you know, appealing to exemplars to motivate change making. Um, if you're thinking specifically about whether we on the Meta Change Makers team are trying to cultivate change makers through us modeling it, um, I mean, that would be nice, but also I kind of feel like what we're doing as a research, okay, you're not thinking about that? Okay, that's great, because I feel like we're too far removed from participants for them to actually even know who we are or care about us. Um, uh, but yeah, so maybe have a look at the annotated bibliography, see whether it responds to your comments, and if there's anything that you want to share, feel free to get in touch with us. We're more than happy to chat. Yeah, we do have some work um, that we cite by Bill Damon and um, Ann Colby and um, Jeffrey Cohen that really talk about using moral exemplars for um, m motivating or um, guiding people towards becoming uh, change makers. Thanks.